I think basically it's a human characteristic that we are curious. And when you look anthropologically around the world, you can pretty much name the culture and they'll have a creation story. We know our own from the Judeo-Christian tradition. Those of us are from Northern Europe in that tradition. There are others in South Asia. There are others in Aboriginal Australia. There are others right here in California. And there's only one way to figure out what really happened. So if you treat it more like a forensic science and ask, let's figure out what happened here. Let's, let's, not, let's not wave our arms. Let, let's not imagine. Let's not speculate. Let's not do science fiction. Let's do science. Well, in 1990, we had worked on the east side of the river. We had found the Lucy species, uh, equivalent to the bottom of the Hadar Formation, and we'd seen sediments a little deeper in time. Unfortunately, they were all lake beds and you don't find early hominids or other primates in the middle of a lake. So we had to get to the edge. And by doing that on the west side of the river, we were able to push deeper into time. And we found one band at about 5.2 million years, very rich in vertebrate fossils. But we were really frustrated because we couldn't find any hominids at all. We had horses, pigs, hippos, rhinos, elephant, all kinds of fauna, gigantic tortoises but we couldn't get any hominids, and we couldn't figure out why. And right at the end of the field season, we finally said, you know, we're just not getting hominids, let's move up the stratigraphy a notch. And we found a horizon at 4.4 million years ago that just hit the right ecological circumstances that had hominids living, dying, and now their bones, after being suspended there for 4.4 million years, were eroding out onto the surface. And so we were able to put a team on those rocks and begin to exploit that 4.4 million year old horizon. So we went, we put teams in the field, we found more bits and pieces. We found the base of a hominid cranium. We found associated dentitions. We found a partial arm. And we thought, this is great. We went back in the 94 season to see if we could find the rest of that individual whose arm we had found. And it turned out that we couldn't, but nearby, we found a different individual's skeleton. And when we first found it, it didn't look like a skeleton at all. A graduate student at the time, Johannes Haile Selassie, young Ethiopian scholar, highly trained osteologist, found two little pieces from the palm of the hand, just this bone here. And these little pieces, he picked up and said, this looks like a hominid. So we did what we always do. We scooped up all the loose, already eroded sediment. We run it through a very fine grid, a sieve, and then we picked other pieces out. And as we picked other pieces out, we would find micromammals and bovids and monkeys, but there were hominid hand and foot bones. And as we scraped and brushed that surface, we found some of these bones in place. And so for the rest of that 1994 field season, we focused on that little hill and we were rewarded with a very dense scatter of pieces from a single female individual's skeleton, affording us uh, a really unprecedented look into the hands and the feet and the pelvis, the arms, the jaws, the teeth, the skull of that individual who had died 4.4 million years ago. Artie is a young adult female. We know that from the bone fusion, we know it from the eruption of her dentition. She died fairly young, we don't know why, but we now have hand proportion, foot proportion, limb proportion, and we learned a lot of things about the biology of this creature from this assemblage of more than 120 pieces of bone, all from that one excavation. And so we're able now to realize that this is a creature unlike anything that we've seen before in living primates or even the fossil record. This is a creature, for example, that retained the ability to grasp with the big toe. That is something that humans don't do and Australopithecus didn't do, but Artie did. And then we could ask questions about the rest of the body. What were her limb proportions like? How did her wrist function? And we learned from that and from the bones of the hand that it didn't function like a chimpanzee's functions. It's not a knuckle walker's hand. It's the hand of something else. It's not human. 
but neither is it chimpanzee. And so by going through each part of her anatomy, we're able to understand better the adaptations that characterize the earliest known members of a lineage that ultimately would become human. She's by no means a human. Now, what about the world she lived in? Well, we can't learn that directly from her skeleton, but when we look at the pelvis, we see adaptations to climbing that are absent in the Lucy species. And so this is a very, very early biped, still well adapted to arboreal existence, beginning to work on terrestrial resources, but not in the kinds of ecological settings seen in the Lucy species or later hominid species. What we found from those tens of thousands of associated fossils, plants, animals, birds, all of the rest, was that she occupied a woodland setting, not an open grassland savanna. And this also constitutes a kind of a breakthrough in the understanding of the earliest hominids. And it comes back and answers that question, that mystery of why we couldn't find any hominids down low in the stratigraphy. It turns out that hominids are very, very habitat restricted early on in time. It's only later as Lucy and then her descendants arise that the ecological niche of hominids broaden to the extent that we can expect to find their remains in lots of different places. If you go early in time, hominids are rare because they're ecologically restricted.